Let's jump into our message. We are going to be in, in Philippians chapter 3. I don't know if you've noticed, but at the beginning of the semester, way back in the fall, we did Philippians 1. Then around Christmas time, we did Philippians 2. Now we're doing Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to do Philippians chapter 4 after Easter. So we're going to have come through this whole year where it's felt like we've done topical things, 20, 20 verses and such. Instead, you could also look at it and see topical, yes, but we've also have gone through the whole book of Philippians, which is great. So Philippians chapter 3 is a great chapter of Scripture. I mean, absolutely amazing. Here's what's going to happen in Philippians chapter 3. Paul is going to give us three different roles that he plays. We're going to see Paul as the accountant today. We're going to see him as the athlete the next time we get together. And we're going to see him as the alien the final time we look into Philippians chapter 3. He's an accountant today that he's going to show us on the ledger, how do we get our debts paid by the blood of Jesus, by faith in Jesus Christ? Then he's going to say, I'm an athlete by saying, I press on to the upward call that is found in Christ Jesus. Then he's going to be an alien to say this, my citizenship is not on planet earth. My citizenship is in heaven. So we're going to look and we're going to see Paul is the accountant. So CPAs, rise up, be excited. This is your moment in church right here that you've got, that the CPAs get to reign the world at this moment. He's going to be an accountant. Now, when I was in business school in college, um, I took accounting 229 and accounting uh, 230, and they were not my favorite classes, I can assure you. But I took them, I made it through, I got through, I graduated, but we had this project and it was called Billy's Video. And here's what you had to do. You had to do the video, you had to do the accounting for this video store called Billy's Video. Now, students, I want you to hear, there was one day what was called a video store, okay? There was this thing called Blockbuster, all right? And instead of Netflixing your way, of just streaming it, you had to actually go to the video store. It was actually a lot of fun. And you'd look at all the videos and you'd pick out one and you'd leave with a VHS, big thing like this, or a DVD and you would leave. And then you'd have to remember to bring it back to the place in a couple days. That was a video store. So we did for this fictitious place called Billy's Video, we did the accounting for Billy's Video. Now, it was a semester-long project, but for some reason, I thought as a college student, it would be great to start on it the day before. I thought that would be a good idea. So there were some other folks that they thought the same thing. So we got together and literally all night long, we did Billy's video. Now, students, I know your parents never did anything like that. They all made all straight A's and were perfect students, but your pastor did. So we did Billy's video. One of the key parts of Billy's video you had to get right was what was called the balance sheet. It's the balance sheet. It was the liabilities versus the assets. And these two things had to balance out. And what we're going to see is Paul is going to show us the imbalance sheet of coming to know Jesus Christ. That the assets of knowing Jesus actually erases the debt that we have. So not a balance sheet, but an imbalance sheet. But he's going to start in an interesting way. Look in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. As we start this out, let's check it out. Here we go. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. In addition, that's to chapters 1 and 2. My brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me. And it's a safeguard for you. Verse 2, here's where we're going to start. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. So here's the first thing he's going to start with before we get to the balance sheet. He's going to start with this. Be aware of false teachers. Be aware of false teachers. I'm going to say something so important to you, Paul's saying. I want you to be aware of false teachers because what I'm about to get to is absolutely eternally life-changing for you. And I want you to understand it. So I'm going to begin with some of the false teaching you've heard. Now, let me tell you about the false teachers that were taking place in this time. They were what was called the Judaizers, okay? The Judaizers. All throughout the New Testament, you're going to see this battle going on. Here's what they're trying to do. They're trying to take a little bit of Judaism, combine it with Christianity, and make that the route that you get to heaven. So what they're doing in this time is they're saying, we need you to have Jewish circumcision combined with faith in Christ, 
and by bringing Judaism and Christianity together, then you'll be able to go to God. And Paul's going to say, no, it is faith in Christ alone. It's faith in Christ alone. Now, these Judaizers are mixing faith and mixing circumcision. They're mixing Judaism and they're mixing Christianity. And so Paul says in verse 2, watch out for the dogs. Now, why would he say that? Because the Jewish folks at that time often would call the Gentiles dogs. He reverses the phrase and calls the Judaizers dogs. These are fighting words Paul is saying here. He's being really clear and really strong. Here's what this is about. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. What's he talking about? He's talking about circumcision in that moment. For we are, verse 3, we are the circumcision, meaning we are the true circumcision. God has cut away the sin of our heart, and that's the true circumcision. So these false teachers were combining faith in Christ with Jewish law. And that was the false teaching. Now, let me speak to us just a bit about false teaching. It was really hard to be a false teacher back in the biblical days. You know why? Because you had to go town to town, city to city. You had to write things down. You had to get followers to follow. You had to leave somebody in that town to teach more on your, your behalf when you went to the other, uh, other town. Now, all you got to do is have a blog. Now, all you got to do is have an Instagram account, have a Facebook page. You can do it a whole lot easier, a whole lot worldwide. So what is it? What makes a false teacher? Now, we know that false teachers are out there. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits, and grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, and figs are not gathered from thistles. So a healthy tree bears good fruit, but a diseased tree bears bad fruit. Here's what you'll find with false teachers. False teaching and false living. False teaching and false living. Let's talk about false teaching for a minute. What does it mean with false teaching? False teaching is not just an error, okay? False teaching is not just a disagreement on a controversial biblical issue. False teaching is heresy, okay? It is taking away from the gospel or adding to the gospel. That's what false teaching is. Now, John Calvin said, no theologian gets it more than 80% right. So people are going to incorrectly teach things that are not right, okay? I'm sure I've done that before. Everybody's done that. There's things that we make mistakes on that we go, but that's not false teaching. Here's how you can know if it's a false teacher or not. Is the person able to be corrected? Are they able to be corrected? If they're not able to be corrected and they're teaching falsely, then that's a clue. Think about, if you will, in Acts chapter 18, there was a guy named Apollos. Priscilla and Aquila came to him and said, you're not teaching, you only know about John's baptism, you're not teaching the fullness of Christ. He said, I'm not, would you sit down with me and tell me then what I need to be teaching? He was correctable, right? He could be changed. So that's a good sign. Can they be corrected? What is false teaching? Well, false teaching is not about um, the difference in baptism. It's not about the difference in the Lord's Supper. It's not different uh, theological things uh, that could be debated. It's not something that's just an error, some mistake that somebody made. False teaching, this would get to the core of it. It removes something from the gospel. It adds something to the gospel, okay? So to deny the Trinity, to deny the deity of Christ, to deny that Jesus lived a sinless life, to deny the substitutionary death of Christ on your behalf, to deny the resurrection, to deny salvation through grace by faith. Those sort of things, you see, that's where you're removing and pulling away from the gospel of what God has done through Jesus Christ. So there's a difference in making a mistake and a difference in teaching something that's leading people astray. So that's the false teaching part. But also there will be false living. 2 Peter chapter 2, it'd be worth your reading later. 2 Peter chapter 2. He gives us three things. I'll just tell it to you real quickly. It says that they deny the master who bought them. There's pride in defying authority. It says many will follow their sensuality. Often there's sensuality and even sexual sin in false teachers. Then it says, in their greed, they will exploit you. There's a greed for money and material gain. So you end up with false living. You end up with pride and defying authority. You end up with sensuality. And you end up also with greed or material gain, that they're looking to be able to make money on this whole thing. So those are the false teaching 
and the false living. You see that? And so Paul's coming against, he's saying, I want you from the very beginning to understand what this is. And in his case, it was the Judaizers. They were combining circumcision and faith in Jesus Christ, okay? Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Let me show you this. Some men came down from Judea and they began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. You see it? After Paul and Barnabas engaged them in serious argument and debate, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem about this issue. It's what's called the Jerusalem Council is what it's called. And so Paul and these folks come together and they decide, no, it is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. It is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. So our liabilities are to place no confidence in the flesh. That's what we need to do. And so he's saying, I don't want you to place any confidence in the flesh. They're wanting to put a little bit of confidence in the flesh with circumcision and a little bit of confidence in faith with trusting Jesus. And he's saying, your liabilities, your side over here on this side of the ledger, no confidence in the flesh. Because here's the deal, our debts are huge. How will you remove the debts? Will you remove them by good works? Will you remove them by actions? Will you remove them by faith in Jesus Christ? Look in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 3 again. Now verse 3 through 6. You ready? Here we go. 3 through 6. So he said, I don't want you to listen to the false teachers. Now he's going to talk about his resume, his side of the ledger. Verse 3. For we are the circumcision. Now you know what that means. The ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. So here's what he's saying. If this whole thing could be won by the flesh, I would be the top dog. I'd get it done. Here's what we want to do oftentimes, and this is what we've got to be careful of. We want to trust in our resume instead of in Christ's resource. We want to trust in our resume instead of Christ's resource. We want to live in our power instead of living in His power. Our resume is things like this. Well, man, I grew up in the church. I've been a part of the church for 45 years. I've been a part of the church for 85, whatever it is, years. I was saved when I was this age. I was baptized at this age. My dad was a deacon. My mom played the organ. I got a resume. Boom, 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 boom. I could say for me, well, I've been to seminary. Well, I've studied the Bible. I'm a pastor. I've been in ministry. I get to teach the Bible. I've got this resume that I've got all these accolades that are there. And Paul is saying there's nothing on your resume that will remove the liabilities on your balance sheet of the debt you have in sinning before God. Every one of us have sinned before God. We have done things wrong. We knew we were doing it wrong. We did it wrong anyway. We have sinned before God. And that debt right there is not going to be made up by what your daddy did for the Lord, what your mama did for the Lord, how many times you've done this for God, how many times you've shown up at church. It doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to say, well, hey, I've been a Baptist for X amount of years. Let me tell you this. That will not get you to heaven. Nobody goes to heaven in groups. People go to heaven individually trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior. So that's how it works out. So he's saying, I've got this resume. Now let me tell you about Paul's resume. We want our resume to be what we hold on to instead of releasing it and surrendering it to Christ. Why? Because we remain in control. Our accomplishments remain intact. But when we've got to surrender, now we say, Lord, I give it to you. And that's when the resource of Jesus invades our life through salvation is when we say, Lord, it's about you. Grace and trust releases control and brings a life of surrender. Here's what Warren Wiersbe said. Like most religious people today, Paul had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, but not enough righteousness to get him into heaven. It was not the bad things that kept Paul away from Jesus. It was the good things. 
He had to lose his religion to find his salvation. And if you've got just enough morality to keep you out of trouble, you don't have enough righteousness to get you into heaven. Here's Paul's resume. He's basically going to show us, and I'm going to take you through it just step by step. He's basically saying, hey, if you want to play basketball, I'm Michael Jordan. If you want to play golf, I'm Tiger Woods. You want to play defense, I'm J.J. Watt. You want to be a, a part of a business, my stock for my business is higher than it's ever been, and I'm a billionaire already. I've got everything I need, and we're going to see in just a minute, it's worth nothing. That's what he said. It's worth nothing. Now, let me take you through this. I put it in your listening guide. You don't even have to write anything down. You can just look along, take some notes along. It's in your listening guide. Here's Paul's resume. He begins first with his relationship to the nation, to the nation of Israel. The end of verse 4 beginning of verse 5. I have, if anyone has confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day. He says that to these that are talking about circumcision, the Judaizers. Uh, Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. What's he saying? He's saying a Hebrew born of Hebrews means this. I wasn't a Gentile that became a Jew. I was born in a pure Hebrew family. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was circumcised. You want to talk about circumcision? Just as the Jewish ritual said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Of the nation of Israel, I'm a part of it. And I'm even a part of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why would it be a big deal to be a part of the tribe of Benjamin? Well, because we know this. To be a part of the tribe of Benjamin is this. You came from Isaac, not from Ishmael. So you're a part. You're going to go in that line. It goes further of that, of realizing this. Benjamin and Joseph were Jacob's favorite sons. So Benjamin and Joseph were Jacob's favorite sons. Not only was Jacob the father, the mom wasn't Leah, the mom was Rachel. Do you know that story? Rachel was the wife that Jacob wanted. So Benjamin is the son and the favorite, one of the favorite sons of Jacob and Rachel. The first king of Israel came from the line of Benjamin. Benjamin, when Absalom was trying to take over and, and beat David and to, to get the kingship from David, Benjamin was the tribe and the folks that didn't go with him. So he says, hey, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm of the nation of Israel. And if you don't think that's enough, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Bam, mic drop at that moment. My relationship with the nation of Israel for you Judaizers is as pure as it's going to get, but it doesn't stop there. My relationship to the law, it says as regarding the law as a Pharisee. Now, when you and I hear Pharisee, we hear the word hypocrite. That's what we hear. We hear Pharisee, we hear hypocrite. And that's true. As we look through the New Testament, we can see that. But when they heard Pharisee, they didn't hear hypocrite. They heard righteous religious leader. That's what they heard. Righteous religious leader. Respected and righteous religious leader. And Paul says, as to the law, I'm a Pharisee. And to the relationship with the enemies regarding zeal, persecuting the church. Now, I was born, we were all born in places. We didn't have any choice about that, right? The family you got born into, where you got born, all that Hebrew of Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin. He didn't have any choice about that. The the righteousness of a Pharisee had some choice about that. But persecuting the enemies of God, or or the enemies of Judaism, I should say, in this this thought, they thought it was the enemies of God, he persecuted the church. Do you remember in Acts chapter 7, a guy named Saul, Saul, Paul, the same guy, they laid down their cloaks at the feet of this guy named Saul. He gave hearty approval to the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, martyr, that he was stoned to death and killed. Saul, Paul, he said, "Uh uh-huh, bring it on, throw those rocks. Then in Acts chapter 8, he went after the church. He started going after women and children. He was trying to kill everybody. He was going to destroy the church. He says, as to zeal, I went after the enemies, the perceived enemies of Israel in this. So he says, to my resume, I am Tiger Woods. I am Michael Jordan. I am J.J. Watt. I'm the biggest businessman you could ever find. I am the one that would have the perfect resume, but it's not enough. And listen. So I need someone to step in on my behalf. I can't get to heaven on this resume. I need someone else to step in on my behalf. I don't know if you heard last May, there was a a graduation speaker at Morehouse College. You would have wished he'd been at your college given your graduation talk. 
because he stood up and he said this, I want to put some gas in the tank. He was a billionaire, a guy named Robert Smith, a billionaire, and he stepped up to give the commencement address, and he said this, my family is going to give a gift of $34 million to forgive the college debt of every student here that has college debt. And they went berserk. You can tell the difference of the parents that had saved their whole life to pay for college and the ones that had taken on debt, right? Because the ones that had saved their whole life are like, well, I got ripped off on this deal. The ones that paid the, that had a bunch of debt, they're like, yeah! Could the students have done that on their own? No way. That's why they were flabbergasted. They needed someone to step in their place to retire their liabilities and debts on the balance sheet. They needed somebody else, a billionaire, to step up for them. And Paul's going to show us who that person is that steps up for us. His name is Jesus. His resume won't get it done. I need somebody else. Look at verses 7 through 9, the last little section we're going to look at, 7 through 9. But everything that was a gain to me, I count or consider to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss and a surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung or rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Now, verse nine, here's the key. Don't miss this. Being found in him and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Did you hear that? He said, I don't need circumcision. I don't need my religious heritage. I don't need my resume. I need the righteousness that comes from God. I know my liabilities with sin. Now I need assets and trusting in someone greater than me. See, the balance sheet, you got liabilities, and all of us got them. We are steeped in debt with our sins before God. But our assets are to trust in someone greater than me. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about his resume. Not your resume, not my resume. His resume is prophesied all throughout the Old Testament that he would be the savior of the world. His resume is that he was born in Bethlehem exactly where he should be born. His resume is that he was born of a virgin. His resume is he lived a sinless life. His resume is he died on a cross to pay for your sins and my sins. His resume is he rose again from the grave to conquer the grave and death. His resume is he sits at the right hand of the Father and has sent the Holy Spirit to indwell the hearts of believers. That's his resume. And here's what you and I have to do is place our debts, our liabilities on our balance sheet that will never get done, will never erase those, place, place those at the foot of the cross. That's right. And say, Jesus, I need you, someone greater than me, to find my righteousness in you alone. I don't have enough righteousness on my own. I need your righteousness. And then here's what happens. It's called imparted righteousness, imputed righteousness. God puts something in you. You're so righteous. Get this, hear this afresh. You're so righteous. The Holy Spirit, holy, the holy, the Holy Spirit can now live inside of you. Wow. What? In me? This lustful, greedy heart? Yes, because I'm a new creation and the old is gone and the new has come. Yes, because he's taken my sins and removed them as far as it is from the east to the west. Yes, because Jesus said it is finished. Yes, because this is so good. He who was rich became poor so that I, me, you, us who are poor could become rich through Jesus Christ. And now the balance sheet is totally imbalanced. The goal is not to balance your sheet. I've done some bad, I'm gonna do some good. The goal is for complete imbalance. The debts have been paid through the blood of Jesus Christ and Christ now lives inside of you and the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. So now you've got every asset. Peter puts it like this, for I have all things for, to live out a life of, uh, I have all things for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Jesus is now your treasure. 
He's your heart. And he is the one that takes you to heaven, not your resume. His resume, his righteousness. That, my friend, is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're not 100% sure, I want to give you as clear as I can say it to you. It's not about going to church. It's not about doing the right stuff. It's not about being a nice person. It's not about trying to weigh the balances like this. Here's what it's about. It's about you realizing your resume will never get it done. And you'll never extinguish all the debt that's on your liability side. And you trust in someone greater and you say, Jesus, I want you to forgive my sins and I want you to be my savior. Wash me clean. I need it to be you on the cross paying for my sin and rising again from the grave. And now Jesus forgives you and the debts are paid and Christ lives inside of you. And if you've just been doing church, I just want to tell you about Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Savior of my heart, the Savior of most of the folks in here's heart, but the Savior can be for your heart as well of knowing Christ. Place your trust in Him. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a bit. And here's what I'm asking you to do in just a minute. There's going to be people standing down front at the cross house for you to get up out of your chair, walk down the aisle and say, I need to ask Jesus to be my Savior. And I need to put my faith in Him because this is of eternal significance. If you already know Christ as your Savior, then live in His power realizing the assets you have are so great to live in his power. Let me give you the sermon in a sentence. Live in his power, not in mine. What are we to do? Live in his power. I want to live in your power, God, not in my power. Not in my power for salvation, not in my power for sanctification, not in my power to be a dad, to be a mom, to be a a friend, to be an employer, an employee. I want your power to come through me with the Holy Spirit that now lives in my heart. That's the sermon in a sentence. And Jesus' righteousness comes in you. I'll give you one illustration and then we'll wrap up. Paul said, there's false teachers. Don't let them add anything to this. Don't let them take anything away from this. It's about surrendering to the righteousness of God. Your liabilities, my resume is better than anybody else's will ever be. And it's still not going to get the job done. Jesus Christ has come and I want to find a righteousness just in him alone. So now faith in the gospel of Christ, the good news. Balancing the scales isn't good news. Letting Jesus forgive your heart and your soul, that's good news. That makes the whole difference. Here's the last illustration. There was two men, they were brothers and they were penniless and they lived in a cave outside of Budapest. Okay? Budapest hungry. They live in a cave outside of Budapest. They're penniless Homeless brothers who live together in a cave. Some social workers find them. They come after them. They find them in the cave. And they say, guys, we've got something to tell you. Your grandmother has died. They said, we don't know our grandmother. Well, your grandmother has died. And your grandmother was a very wealthy lady. I've got to sit down when I tell you this, okay? And you have inherited seven billion dollars the homeless men living in a cave outside of Budapest Hungary inherit seven billion dollars now I'm sure there's a whole nother problems in sermon you know to, to get into that get, get that kind of money when you've been homeless in a cave it's interesting just kind of a funny thing they said this they said you know when we lived in a cave uh, no ladies would take us seriously But all of a sudden now, you know, $7 billion later, uh, there's some people that want to go out with us on a date. It's an interesting type thing. So no shame on y'all ladies. I'm just trying to say a little something funny. So they make all this money and they get this whole thing and they have $7 billion. Can I just tell you this? Jesus Christ has given you far more than $7 billion. That $7 billion is going to run out one day. That $7 billion is still going to end up in a casket one day. And that casket isn't going to get to heaven because of $7 billion. But Jesus Christ has given you far more than $7 billion. He's given you the riches of the righteousness of God. And so I want to call you to that today. Be an accountant. But let's don't try to balance the sheet. Let's realize the gospel imbalances the sheet. It's not about Billy's video. 
It's about Jesus' grace. And to let God imbalance the sheet with the assets, the righteousness, the grace that comes through faith in Christ alone. Do you know him as Savior? If you do, are you living in his power? Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. Make us always aware, Father, of false teaching. Make us always aware when our resume is just a little bit too impressive to us. But Father, make us so aware of the righteousness of God that comes through the death and resurrection of Jesus, through grace, through faith. And may we trust that if we come to the cross, we trust you as Savior, that there will be an imbalance sheet in our life. That's the place we want to live from and live in your power. Do you know Christ? Are you walking in his power? What did you hear from the Lord in this time? Speak it back to him. Just say, I heard you. I give that to you, God. I'm telling you, my, my biggest heart in this entire day and in this room is for those who don't know 100% that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This whole message is for you. Not your resume. His resurrection. Come. Talk with somebody. Pray in your seat. Place your faith in Jesus as Savior. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.